Welcome to No Instructions. I'm Bob. And I'm Josh. You're sick. I am getting over being sick, but nobody told my sinuses. <laughs> Dear sinuses. Yeah. You're, you're done. You can, we can move on now. <laughs> you do sound better than you sounded a couple of days ago. Yeah. But there's still a lot of stuff coming up. It's, it's not like cement poured in my head anymore. I can breathe. But I breathe loud. <laughs> so it's, the the path is not completely clean. But it's getting there. Yeah, at least it's on its way. Uh, your kids are all better? Yeah, all the kids are better. Good. Turds. <laughs> like it's their fault that they're sick. No, it's not their fault they're sick. They just like, yeah, I'm better. I'm fine. Hooray. And they jump around and they don't even care. I'm like, meh. I want to be better. I have stuff to do. You guys are better and you have no agenda. Lucky duckies. Uh, speaking of, of stuff to do, you had your uh, audition. Oh, I did. How did it go? Apparently, it went well enough for them to want me to play in the band. Good. Yeah. Uh, there were some audio issues. So the last place that I played, we used in-ear audio. Uh, this place is this place is, does the same, but they had a different system. A system called an Avium. And so I had my headphones just because I used to wear headphones and studio in-ear like studio monitors, like multiple drivers are very expensive. So mm -hmm. I never even thought about buying some. So I just had headphones. So put my headphones in, went to go play. And I'm like, I can't hear myself. I'm on my own channel. I'm cranked up as loud as I can possibly be. And I still can't hear myself. And everybody else is like, well, I can hear you. And I'm like, well, great. This is going well right off the bat. I can't hear myself. So people in the, the audio booth or the audio section that messed with all the stuff for the speakers like were adjusting my levels as i was playing the song and it was messing me up bad yeah but i was trying not to pay attention to it and the, we played the song twice and the first time was fine but i was really self-conscious because i made my bass and i have an amp at home and i play it and it's it's just fine but i'm like oh my goodness what did i do <laughs> Did I do such a what terrible job that just problem. like the sound is so inconsistent? The volume is just like, is the gain all over the place? And it turned out they were trying because I couldn't do an adequate sound check up front because I couldn't hear myself. And then I finally got some, I borrowed some monitors. I had my own little earpieces. Um, so when we were playing the song, they were adjusting my levels. But I had already cranked myself up really loud because I couldn't hear myself. So as they were trying to adjust, it was just blaring out my, my head. It was so loud. And so, which caused me to not play as loud because I thought what I was hearing, everybody else was hearing. Mm. And they were like, well, we couldn't hear you. So we turned you up even more the second time. And it was right in this part. It was during the bridge. And there's a fun part where like, I get to go high on the neck and do -do 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 -do, a little bit of that. And I was transitioning to it and just, it exploded with sound. <laughs> it was so loud and it caught me off guard. And I... I missed the first note of that transition, but I, I, I kind of got it. And I was just like, okay, just don't, don't pay attention to it. Just look at something out in the distance and just play <laughs> and try not to think about your brain or your ears. <laughs> and it got done and everybody's like, that was great. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> I, I can't hear anything. And then the person who was, I guess, evaluating me, I was like, yeah, I don't know what happened. I was like, I hope it's not my base. Uh, she's like, oh no, that was us. She's like, it got really quiet. And it was your audition, so we wanted to make sure that, you know, you had the best possible setup you could. So we, we turned you up right in the middle. She was like, I noticed it messed you up. I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> a, a little bit. So getting there, having the right equipment up front and sound check time kind of hurried and rushed everything. So, I mean, it was fine. Yeah. Everybody was happy. Everybody was flabbergasted that I made my own bass. And I guess now it's our, our superpower is just so natural that i mean i made it because it was not that difficult to make but to someone else who buys you know two thousand dollar five thousand dollar instruments mm -hmm. the idea that you just make your own sounds crazy so yeah i yeah. guess i'm i'm in a band now that's cool you know well good and i'm sure like all of the tech stuff will be you know once you get in there and and play a couple of times that will be the thing that fades away very quickly and just Everybody knows how to do it and whatever. Yeah, I'll have more than like a minute to figure it yeah. out. And then the the in-ear monitors that they have that are very professional, 
which even though I've played in like a setting like that, it, I was working up to that setting like I mentioned last week. Mm-hmm. So having those was like, oh, you're good. So you have fancy headphones. I have my skull candies that have been sitting in the console of my Jeep for a year that I had to clean off before I come in here and play. <laughs> so those are very expensive. And this guy was like, oh, no, they're really not. He's like, I, I got a pair on Amazon for like $49 when the ones that I looked at were 300 and they're like, oh, they're really good. And yeah. So everybody was really nice. Everybody was real relatable. I knew a couple people in the band already. So, yeah, everybody was extremely complimentary, and it was it was very comforting and comfortable. Good. Yeah. Glad to hear that. When I was playing with Rob a couple weeks ago, that whole hearing yourself and the... Um, it's a thing you get used to if you do it a lot, but when you're not used to it, the there's an uncertainty about when you're controlling your own monitor and you're playing, like... If you turn it up so you can hear yourself, you feel like you're playing really loud, and that means that everybody else can hear you really loud. Yep. The truth of the matter is they have their entire individual control over what they hear of you. Yep. But you don't know that. And so, like, when I was playing with them, I was trying to hear myself but not play too loud because I don't want to, like... I didn't really want them to hear me because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and so it was weird, and I kept having to remind myself that, like, I, I have no control over what they hear at all. Yep. Uh, it, but it is a kind of a weird thing to get used to. And especially playing the bass, like, I like that song, and there's parts where you can get kind of heavy in that song. There's some low, low, hearty whole notes in it. It was really good, and I was, I became very timid because of, everything was so loud. Right. Instead of just, like, pulling that string and just letting it ring, Yeah, I, I pulled my punches while I was playing because the audio had messed me up. But whatever, overcame, tried to ignore it. And apparently it worked out. So next time I play, uh, there needs to be extra time dedicated to figuring out the sound. Yeah. Cool. Very good. Um, the other night I came home. And, you know, we talked about music last week, so I wanted to kind of give an update. I came home and was by myself for a little while one evening. And I was like, you know what? I'm finally just going to... Oh, I, I mentioned the uh, Fender app. I don't know if that was on here. Or I'm yeah, you did. It. Oh, it was somewhere. I was going to try to learn the guitar stuff that I had missed out or I feel like I don't know from the Fender app. Turns out mm-hmm. that's a bad idea. It's like, how to learn Black Sabbath songs, how to learn Alice uh. in Chains, how to learn... And it's like, <laughs> I don't really want... That's not what I want. So, um, and I thought there was a whole free section. I don't think there actually is, huh. which was kind of a bummer, so you couldn't even really try it out. Anyway, I was like, there's got to be a billion resources on YouTube. I'll just see what I can find. So I spent, I don't know, 40 minutes or so just kind of looking around. Ran across two different guys, one named, I don't know, this isn't even worth it, Steve Okay. something, Steve S, Steve Steve Sandy. Lightning Hammer. <laughs> He's got long blonde hair and a bunch of tattoos on his arm. What? Steve, yeah, go, hmm. go, 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 <laughs> Steve, go Steve, band. Steve, you'll find him. Um, that guy, and then there's another guy named Marty, and his channel is called Marty Music, that was easy enough, um, but, well, the... Hmm, that was weird. Um, and they both had really different approaches to the theory part of it, because that's specifically what I was looking up, and found this the Steve guy, a really simple explanation of some uh, relational stuff, like we were talking about the first, third, fifth, and mm-hmm. it, I'm, I don't want to go into it here, but it was a, a, a music theory relational thing that I should have gotten 30 years ago when I was playing <laughs> piano, when I was taking lessons. And somehow I just didn't get that. Uh, it was the difference between major and minor chords and the spacing in between the first, third, and the fifth on the keyboard, which you can actually just look at and see. And it makes a lot of sense, and I just never learned that. So that was really cool, and that was one of his free videos. So then uh, the next day, I pulled up Facebook and immediately got an ad for his online course, of course. But I bought it so it's a 12-week course it's got a whole bunch of lessons uh and i decided that i should just go ahead and pay it was like 97 dollars, i think so i'm just gonna go ahead pay for it now i have no reason not to get that information i like the way he talked about it he was not condescending he was like yeah you know not trying to teach you how to solo he has a separate soloing course (laughs) but this was just theory stuff so i decided to pay for it and then hang that over my own head to do it you know like you invested money in this so now yeah. you have to if you don't do it you're wasting money and that's stupid so do we need to schedule a recital 
<laughs> no, I did enough recitals. I don't want to do that anymore. All right. <laughs> Would you like to do a recital, a bass recital? Well, because <laughs> it's funny. Without speaking about this, I did the same thing with Scott's bass lessons that I talked about last week. Because mm. he had a free course over the holidays that I took on walking bass lines. It was really good. And I'm like, well, let's check out the rest of his course. I'm like, but it, I don't know what the course entails. And if you go on the website and it's like, here's a sneak peek at what the course entails. You can mm. get a 14 day, 14 day free trial. So I, I hit the do the 14 day free trial, but just got busy and didn't do the rest of the, the login kind of information. And the same thing, I opened up Instagram and there's Scott's Space Lessons like, hey, I saw you opened up a 14 day free trial. You got to finish doing the thing. But I haven't done it yet. Yeah. But it's the same thing. Like, I want to. I want to get better at that thing. It's, I don't know why that was in some weird bubble. You know, hmm. we talk about getting better at welding or getting better at running or swimming or whatever it is. Like, everything takes work. Yeah. And out of all of the, you know, air quotes, like hobbies or skills that we are trying to accumulate in this tool bag or like, I, I like to think of it like MacGyver. Like, you throw MacGyver in a situation, and he looks around, and is like, I can do anything I need to do with the things that I have around me. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be in a position in life where I just don't know what to do. Like, that bothers me yeah. fundamentally. Yeah. And yep. I think both of us have been in situations where we felt helpless in, in life, and it's impacted us in, I think, much deeper ways than I thought. Because it's, it's tangentially related. Like, if there's hmm. an emergency mm -hmm. or... I don't know. I, the emergency stuff kind of comes to mind. But when I didn't know what to do, I'm like, I'm a helpless person right now. Right. And so then I'm like, I never want to be left wanting and knowing how to do something. And so when I walk into a room, I go, man, there's musical instruments all in this room. Like, I should know how to play all of these instruments. Right. Like, oh, those people at the coffee shop, uh, there's words about lattes and crap on the wall. I'm like, I don't know what that means. I feel stupid. That is unacceptable to me. I have to figure out how to do this. Hmm. So it's just, it's a weird, always chasing mentality for me. Because if I'm put in a situation kind of more than one time, I feel like I have to know at least a bare minimum. So that you're prepared. So I am yeah. prepared and I don't feel stupid. Right. Music yeah, I mean, is that way. I, yeah, I, I can see that for sure. I, I think the whole thing about, for me, building a shop and getting more tools is not about uh, ownership or not about like just wanting more. It's about being prepared. It's yeah. about someday if I want to come in here and be like, you know what? I want to make a, I don't know. I can't even think of anything. I want to make a typewriter. Like I need to have what I don't need. I would like to have what I need on hand to make a typewriter from scratch, which is totally ridiculous. And you know, unrealistic but at the same time think of all the weird stuff that we make all the time yep and those are all just practices toward someday we'll have an idea and we'll need to do it and we will have at some point probably executed most of the skills needed to make that thing yep so and that was uh, last night at my audition um the the leader of the band i pulled my bass out of the case and he was like that is beautiful he's like what kind of bass is that i'm like oh, i made it and he's kind of stopped cold. He's like, hold on, what? I'm like, I, I made it. And he was looking at it. He's like, holy crap, you did make that. I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I just made it. It's a thing that I don't think is that strange. And being around other people that don't do that regularly, or the, the couple friends that we have that are also in the band, um, our friend Chris was in the drums. He was like, yeah, he makes stuff like that all the time. He's not that impressed by it. <laughs> and like Chris literally Chris like makes flipped like a house. I'm like, Chris made a house. Yeah. I made a base. That's something completely different. I'm like, yeah, but yeah, I made it. And it, it to me is nonchalant or is a non issue because I have worked at accumulating all those random little skills or random little things that you can kind of put in the, the gray matter of your brain that I'll need this one day. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question. We didn't talk about this beforehand, but like, what's a thing that you haven't, that you don't have there yet? A skill set? Welding. But you've done it now. I don't know. Have we? <laughs> we Maybe. have. Yeah, yeah, but like, I want to do that more right. um, because metal is a thing that, uh, I mean, I'm surrounded by that can break. Or if I'm in some crazy 
scenario that I need to make something. It's just it, trying to find all the infrastructure is, is one thing. But yeah, not knowing how to do it. I'm uncomfortable with not knowing how to do something. So yeah. welding was one. Um, music, like being better at music is definitely one. Uh, fixing my own car. Hmm. That's always been yeah. like a battle for me. Like I, I think we've maybe talked about this. I was a helicopter mechanic. I am an FAA certified mechanic and fixing my own car seems like this, this daunting task that I can't do. And I remember I was, I was in the army and what I was working on, what's called a phase team and a phase team. Like you tear apart the helicopter to, it looks like it had just crashed. Like it's the, it's the, the bones you do a whole bunch of inspections. It's months long. And then you put the whole thing back together and then it goes and flies. I was on a phase team, like tearing apart to the, the guts of a thing that defies gravity. And I'm like, Oh man, I need to get my, my Jeep somewhere to get the oil changed. Cause the lights on. <laughs> and I remember going like, I can change the oil in a helicopter transmission. It takes seven gallons of oil. And I'm like, why can't I do this to my own vehicle? Like, yeah. this seems silly. And I did. I went out and I did it, and it wasn't a big deal. But that seems to be, in in my bravery, that seems to be like the task that I was like, yay, look, I did it. Hmm. Anything else? I'm like, oh, God, I don't know. It's just a, it's a hodgepodge of hoses. And I haven't taken the time to deep dive into the theory of like, well, you need fuel, you need spark, you need air movement and it needs to be water cool probably and a battery to start the thing. And so like on a super basic level, I get it, but I don't know how that translates to all of the stuff under the hood of my own car. Right. Yeah. when I got the Land Cruiser, I decided to try to understand that stuff a little bit more. And part of the reason for that was because that I knew the Land Cruiser was built to be fixed on the side of the road with hand tools. Mm. Like that's one of the things about them. Maybe not the modern ones, but the older ones. Um, and so I knew that there was a whole lot I could do and I didn't necessarily have to have a computer, you know, to like read the computer and the, the thing. And cause that's, unfortunately, that's how a lot of cars are now is like, you can't fix a lot of yeah. them. Um, and I've done a little bit to it, uh, you know, where I'm comfortable, but at the same time, there's like a place where it becomes really counterproductive to try to be able to do everything which is opposite of what we're saying. But, you know, if... I don't remember what the thing was. Something went out on it. And I was like, well, I can take this whole thing apart. I can get underneath it and wrestle it and go back and forth to the shop to get the right, you know, sockets a thousand times. And then my car will be out of commission for months, maybe, while I figure it out and order the right parts. Or I can take it to a place and it'll be done in an hour. And it'll cost me like 150 bucks. Like, you know, yeah. if I had a whole bunch of free time, or maybe if I had another car, if it was a project car or something. But like, I need that car to get places. So certain certain times like that with the car stuff, it's not worth it for me, even though I do kind of want the same thing. I would love to understand all of it and be able to talk intelligently about the internals of a car, which, I mean, I can, I guess, to a degree. More of like a theoretical than yep actual but there's a, a big bang theory episode that's like that you ever watch that show i've seen it a couple times my dad really likes it and there was one where the, the all the the nerdy guys on the show like they're having car trouble and they all pretty much waxed intellectual about the inner workings of an internal combustion engine and how it all worked and they're like great does anybody know where it is and they're like no <laughs> <laughs> but i think with that, um, your Vespa project and like you moving out, we, we cleaned up the shop. We moved out the pieces of your the Harley frame that you have in here. And I thought a way for me to try to get better at this very topic would be to renovate or not renovate, but like restore a, a cheap motorcycle. Because mm -hmm. I've always loved the idea. We've talked about this before about riding a motorcycle, but they're expensive and I don't want to pay a lot of money for it. So if I get a, a clunker, if I get a, a junky one, and I'm forced to figure out all of those pieces on a much smaller, more right. manageable scale that does not have the same gravity as my daily driver, I think that would be a much more approachable way to figure out you know, automotive work. Hmm. Yeah. So I've been considering doing that. 
Yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, and especially, like, that's one of the reasons I think I was interested in the Vespa is because it's even simpler than a motorcycle. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's a two-stroke. There's, like, three things that have to work on it. And if those three things work, then you can drive it. And for me, not having any understanding of how a carburetor worked at the time or how just a basic two-stroke engine worked, I was like, that seems small enough that I can probably figure that out, you know. And I did learn a whole lot from doing that. Um, and I probably need to put time into it again to get it running again because it doesn't run. I did something wrong here. What did because you do? I don't know, but there's a, a red chunk here sticking out that's uh -huh. not supposed to. Where's the little can? Oh, right there. It's down there. This little red chunk right here is not supposed to be there. Uh -uh. Which means something is not fully in. It's one of the bad things about talking while you make sets, <laughs> is you miss things. Um, I had another thought. Oh, yeah. It was, so you're talking about welding and how it was like you want to be able to do that. One of the coolest things, um, when I did that DIY escape room thing, mm -hmm. <laughs> one of the coolest things is I was in there with Grant Thompson and uh, this guy, I can't think of his name. He was really nice in this woman who was also really nice and i can't think of her name either but they were tradespeople. like they they worked they fixed things for a living and the renovated houses and stuff she was uh, an electrician and he kind of did a bunch of different stuff and so it was the four of us and we we're in this situation and we were trying to open this door and we did it in the wrong i didn't do it in the wrong order somebody else did it in the wrong order and broke a piece of the door some metal gear and they were like, oh, well, we broke the door. It's stuck. Now we can't, we can't, we're not going to be able to complete the escape room because we can't get through the door. And I'm like, there's a welder over there and I can weld this thing. And they were all like, you can weld? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I can. Yes, I can. You can't? Like, I'm pretty sure I would be the one in that room that didn't know how to do the thing because they were all huh. really accomplished at what they did. And it felt super cool to be like, give me those. Let me go <laughs> fix that and I'll be right back. Uh, and yeah, it, that was pretty neat. I've told you that whole story, right? About how you did, and I was happy for you. Well, the, I, I mean, was the, very jealous. The funny part of the story was that we broke the thing, and then I figured that a way to fix it would be to we we couldn't get it off the door, and so I was like, I'll go bring the welder to it. And so I go over there, and the welder's bolted to the floor. So I started unscrewing it from the floor, and I got the entire thing loose. And was ready to pull it out of the thing. And finally, they came over the little loudspeaker in there. They were like, you can't move the welder. I'm like, why didn't you yes, tell me I that can. before I unbolted it and spent like five minutes with, you know, an adjustable wrench, like trying to figure out how to get all this thing free. Anyway, it was fun. See, this is why I love escape rooms for, for this very topic is that it, I am placed in a situation I know nothing about. And I have to use all of those little skills and things that I have accumulated to get out of a situation and some of them are extremely silly and fantastical and and are very plot driven and so there's no way like i was in one that was like you're, you're traveling to the future and i was in some like alien type room like i've never been in that situation before but <laughs> wow. little tiny pieces of things that i've done in the past allowed me to kind of connect all the dots and figure what we need to do and once i don't know if i've told the story when i was handcuffed to a table with my boss's boss can I talk about that? Uh, I don't know but if you've done it on here. But. So the very first escape room I went to was in Colorado on a work trip when I was with Lockheed. And I was on this uh, this Dump. working group, <clears throat> excuse me, that we had to meet quarterly to talk about all the stuff that we talked about. And so I went with like very high level people and I was out, it was like a, it was a business trip and I didn't have anything to do for these days. And I had heard about escape rooms and I'm like, I want to do this. This sounds awesome. I found one near where we were staying. Uh, I went in and I'm like, one escape room, please. <laughs> and they were like, you need more than just you. I'm like, false. You don't know me. I am awesome. I can do this. And the guy was like, brother, you, you can't. I promise you, you can't. Because of the way that I wanted to do the one, it was like you were a spy. It had a very loose, very short, kind of brief. He's like, you need at least four people because of the way that they set it up. So I went to uh, these two people that I had met on a flight. And my boss's boss, who happened to be on the trip with me. And I'm like, hi, uh, I need you guys to come with me and get handcuffed to a table. <laughs> 
and you have to get out of this room uh, within an hour, and if you don't, you lose. And they were like, what in the world are you talking about? I'm like, you just kind of kind of trust me. I know you don't know me, but it'll be fun, I think. And they were like, yeah, sure, why not? It was great. Ah, oh, no. Oh, jeez. But it's exactly what it sounded like. We It was in a very stark room. It had a big mirror and just this table, just like you would think on NYPD Blue. And my my again, my boss's boss and I were handcuffed to this table together. And there was barely anything in this room. And the, they had went through a whole spiel. And they're like, all right, you're not getting out of here, spies. And then they, like, slam the door and <laughs> clunk, 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 have a bunch of locks. And he just looks at me. He's like, what in the world did you just get me into? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, yeah, shut up. I got to figure this out. <laughs> and when I was in the Army, I went through survival training. And I, I, there was a time where I got really bored and wanted to learn how to pick locks. And so I know how to pick locks. And I'm like, oh, there's a paper clip in this thingy over there. So I reached out and grabbed it. And within seconds, busted me and my boss's boss out of these handcuffs. And he just looked at me. He was like, what in the world do you do? Like, I was a new hire. And they knew I was in the Army. He was like, what did you do when you were in the military? And I'm like, well, I mean, a lot of stuff. but." And so that was the thing. Like, if we were anywhere within a work function, I impressed that guy with something that was non-work related. And he told everybody about it. Hmm. And it was just one of those like, oh, yeah, I remember from this one thing a long time ago that I could do this when other people can't. And so an escape room to me is just a random time when I can exercise all of those little tiny superpower skills. All of your little badges, your merit badges that you've accumulated, it's time to put them to work. So I love them. We're going to a lot of places and I want to go to a lot of escape rooms. And usually when we go on trips to go to places, it's so busy and there's so many people and there's lobbies to hang out in that no one else wants to do it. But I think for Workbench Con, I'm going to ditch whoever I need to ditch and go do an escape room because mm. I haven't done one in a while. And then when I showed up here, that was like one of the first things that we were doing. Oh, yeah. That's right. And you're like, oh, yeah, Lowe's wants me to go to this escape room. I'm like, I love escape rooms. I've been to, I think, eight. I have, I have successfully completed seven of eight. And the one that I didn't was because it was just my brother and I in a room that was meant for 10 people. Hmm. And we got hung up on the very last thing. And I was so angry when the lady came in. But yeah, you got to go do the thing. And it sounded amazing. And I'm like, yeah, that would have been really fun. And I was really jealous. <laughs> Not that you got to hang out with Grant Thompson. R.I.P. Is that you got to go do an escape room where you actually got to use tools yeah. and like break stuff. And I'm yeah. like, oh, that, that PS2 resistance. And several, several times, like when we've gone places... You've been like, yeah, let's go do one. I'm like, I don't know if it's going to be as fun as the one that I did that time. And I honestly, I just, that one was pretty awesome. And uh, I'm not sure that any of the other ones are going to keep me as interested. Well, just like the music conversation last week, not going to ask you anymore. I'm going to go. And if you want to come, then you can come. If not, I'll do the whole thing by myself in record time. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I went somewhere and there was just a picture of this dude with his thumb up, like in the lobby, just some guy. And I'm like, it caught me off guard because usually when you do escape rooms, they're kind of, they're based on time blocks. And so you kind of wait for your party or whatever. And I remember like, what's this picture of this dude? And the the girl who was running the place was like, oh, that's, I think his name was Jeremiah. It was like, Jeremiah has beat every room in here all by himself every time. Oh, wow. And I'm like, Jeremiah. <laughs> So every time I think about an escape room, it's like, oh, it's between eight to ten players. I'm like, uh huh. <laughs> Jeremiah can do it by himself. I can do it by myself. <laughs> That's funny. Um, switch gears completely, absolutely, totally. Uh, it is Valentine's Day, and we were talking earlier about whether we had talked about how we met our wives. Have we talked about that? I don't recall. We we talk a lot. Anthony, have we talked about that? Our historian. So. Um, well, to, to that point... Search back through the archives the, real quick, uh, please. Uh, no Dumb Questions put out an episode today about uh, like all new listeners should listen here. And so they took a bunch of questions or things from their subreddit. And mm. Matt was like, people talk to me about things that we've said on this, ep- on this podcast. He's like, and I don't remember most of them. Yeah. So I think we're off the hook. True. Oh, speaking of, uh, not speaking of that at all, 
you, we posted you know recently. I, I mean, it was it's related, but it not it's in my head. Um, we did a post recently about this show on Instagram, I think, and or Twitter. I don't know, somewhere. And there were so many really nice comments about like this being people's favorite show or a show that they really enjoyed. And I thought that was super cool. It makes my heart happy. Yeah. So thank you to everybody that said that. Um, all right, so we're off the hook with the the wives thing, as in we can talk about it, not that we don't have to talk about it. So, uh, where should we start? You want to just talk about it how you a met? Balmy July afternoon. There's, I have extra pieces. I'm well, missing stuff. Yesterday, you and your wife went out. Yes. Not on. Oh boy, today is Valentine's Day, but you guys celebrate on the thirteenth, and you do that purposely. Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, yeah. Yes. Cheaper prime rib the day before. No, yeah. it, 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 no. so we met at the end of Ju- uh, January. That's the month. Jubilary. <laughs> Jubilary. Ju- um, at the end of January, we went on a ski trip and met there. Started dating about two weeks later, which was the 13th of February. And that was the first time we kissed. And Aww. so that was like a... And it just happened to be the day before Valentine's Day. but So we kind of celebrate the first day that we kind of committed to each other. And it was weird. All right, I'll just start at the beginning. I was engaged to a different girl. To be married? To be married. Oh, boy. To a different person. We had been together for like three years. And I should have known better, but whatever. And so that ended on Thursday. I know, wow. it, was, I know it was a Thursday. Ended on a Thursday, and I was uh, really super bummed out, and just kind of like, I've invested past several years into this thing that I thought was going to be a certain thing for the rest of my life, and it wasn't. And so my buddy, Adams, who I lived with, uh, he was a youth, or like a college assistant at a, at a uh, you, wow, he was the assistant at a college program at a church, like a youth group, but for college people. Okay. So they were getting ready to go on a ski trip the next day. And I was like, man, I need to get out of town. Like, I, I'm just like, this is messing me up. And so he said, well, just come along as a chaperone. You can go for free on the trip. Get away. We'll go snowboard and have fun. And, you know, just think about it. So this is the next day. This is on a Thursday. They leave on a Friday morning. So I go to sleep, get up, drive to the church, pull up into the parking lot, and I see two girls, no, three girls, standing in front of the church that I'd never seen before. I'm like, huh, I wonder who they are. I wonder who she is. Ooh. Right in the middle, looking all cool, all snowboardy. I'm like, man, I've never seen her before. I wonder who is that. So it was Jenny, and we immediately got on the same little van. He, My friend Adams was driving. So I sat up front with him. The girls were in the back. And maybe 10 minutes into the... Right, they start having a burping contest. I could see that. Yeah. That's that's in, on character for Yeah. Me. So between her and Adams next to me, they're just like having an, in this 15-passenger van from the front and the back a burping contest between them. And everybody in between was just dealing with it. And so that was kind of how I met my wife. We, you're like, I'm married at girl. <laughs> but we hung out uh, a little bit during that trip, but not a ton. But I was just like kind of watching her the whole time like, man... Like, where did she come from? Like, she doesn't care what anybody thinks of her. She's having fun. She's snowboards. She's, like, burping all the time. <laughs> you know, it was like she didn't care about yeah. anything else. And I thought that was super cool because the girl I dated before, her family was very proper and very southern and very not Jenny. So, mm. um Anyway, we, the next Tuesday night or so, I think it was a couple nights later, uh, we all went to a coffee shop. She was there, and we got to talking, and I was like, somehow, through sitting down and having coffee, we ended up like, hey, well, everybody else is going home. You want to hang out? Yeah, let's hang out. And I was like, oh, I have an office downtown. I can go show you the office. So, because I had the Because I'm business. big, important people. Yeah. You want to go see my, my desk? It's super cool. <laughs> So we go to the office and just sit there and talk. Because I didn't want to like invite her back to my place, even though I guess going to an office is just as weird and just as private. But There's lots of 80s movies that that scenario takes place. <laughs> so we ended up talking from about 11 p.m. 
or 10 p.m. or something until about 5 or 6 in the morning in wow. my office. And it just talked all night long. And then I uh, took her home. And then I think the next night we did the same thing. And then the next night and the next night. And for a couple of weeks, we were together until very, very early in the morning talking in different places. We'd just go to coffee shops and hang out and whatever. And we got to know each other really quickly because we spent a whole lot of time together. We also didn't sleep. And we both got sick. <laughs> and people started noticing. And like our the college minister at the church kind of pulled us aside one day and she was like, I know you guys really like each other and you're spending a lot of time together, but you need to back off because you're going to get sick and like not, you know, it's not going to be good for you. So just were like you in college at the time? I was out of college. Okay. But I was <clears throat> helping with the college group that I had been in. Um, I have a big pile of pieces here that didn't get used. These things, at least, there's more than Did one you put of those. The little whisker thingies on. No, the uh, front part? maybe not. No, that's what it is. Cool. So that happened for a couple of weeks, and then on February 13th, we were hanging out, and I. So this is we'd known each other for about two weeks, and I said. Look, if we're going to do this, I want this to head towards marriage. Like, that's my goal. I'm laying it out there. And if and if that's not what you want, totally fine. No big deal. But I don't want to mess with it. Like, my not, not that it's one or the other, but, like, that's where I'm headed. So if you're down with figuring that out, if that's the thing for us, then let me know. And she said, that's what I want to. I was like, all right. So that was in February... We got engaged. But so that was not like your engagement. That was a, no, what that are was, your intentions? Yeah, it was okay. like an intention thing. But just like, I, this isn't like a fling. It's not like, let's just hang out and see what happens. Like if we're going to invest, then yeah. that investment is headed this direction. And she was totally on board with that. We kissed for the first time. That was in February. We got engaged in July and married the next March. How did you propose? We were at Sliding Rock in North Carolina. I've been there. Really? Yeah. And so we were uh, went camping with my friend Adams again and some other friends. Went camping and we were up on that rock. So you climb up mm -hmm. one side of it and then you jump off into the pool and then you can slide down the rock. It's super cool if you've never been there. And so uh, we, I told my friends that were with us that I was going to propose to her on this trip. And so like we were coming up and jumping down a bunch of times and I told everybody to kind of wait. She went up and then I went up after her and she was about to jump off and I was like, wait. And I proposed and she said yes. And then tried to put the ring on, and I said no, because I wanted to make sure that she didn't lose the ring in the water by that's, jumping off. That's a smart move. But so she said yes, and then I wouldn't give her the ring, and she still kind of, I think that stung a little bit. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to put this back in my pocket. We'll jump off. We'll get down there, get dry, and then I'll give you the ring, and like everything's good. But, uh, yeah. That's how you know she's just not out for the jewelry. That's right. She stuck around. She didn't like jump and then run. Uh, yeah, so that was... Oh, I think we're coming up on our 18-year anniversary. Nice. Something like that. So, yeah, that's kind of our story. What about you? I'm going to bag five. I met my wife in middle school. But she didn't really know me because I was a dork. And she was the pretty girl. She would laugh that I said that. But she was actually, I didn't know it, but she was dating my best friend at the time. You and didn't know it? No, I didn't know it. Huh. I guess we weren't that close. <laughs> but, I mean, it was middle school. People, like, were yeah. going out and breaking up. And, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't really have a girlfriend because, again, I didn't really know the value in that. I had a girlfriend one time, and all she did was make me listen to her talk on the phone. And I'm like, this sucks. I don't like this. <laughs> and it was the same thing. It was like, who is that girl? Like, I know all the people in my class. Yeah, I've known them for a long time. I'm like, who is she? I'm like, wow, I've never seen her. She's really pretty. I'm like, this is awesome. There's a new girl who's pretty. And then someone's like, oh, yeah, that's JJ's girlfriend. I'm like, oh. How do I kill JJ? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <clears throat> and she was just this this fixture. Like, she was always around. Uh, I always had, like, a little crush on her. But I'm like, well, she's really cute. And I'm kind of a, a dork. So there's really no chance in me ever trying to go mm -hmm. out with her or have more than like a five word conversation. And I mean, we went to high school and it was the same thing. Like we had classes and stuff together. Like we took driver's ed together. Uh, I started dating this other girl. I was on the soccer team for two years and there was this 
weird group of girls that were like soccer groupies. Mm. It was yeah, very strange. We had those. Uh, so I started dating this girl with like zero effort. It was very strange to me. And we dated for a long time. And then we were all in driver's ed together. And the girl I was dating was kind of like, she didn't want to be one of the cool kids. She was in chorus, which was on like the fringe. And she did a lot of things where I guess people didn't like her for whatever reason. I didn't know because I was oblivious to a lot of stuff. And so when we were Tiff and me and some other friends and this girl I was dating, she didn't want us to sit together. She didn't want my girlfriend and I to sit together. She was like, no, go sit over there with those people because I don't want them to like... I don't don't know, make fun of her? I have no idea. So she told me to go sit with, like, the other people that I knew and I was friends with, and Tiffany was one of them. (laughs) And so we would just, like, start talking, and she's like, why don't you sit with your girlfriend? I'm like, I don't know. She's weird, I guess. Girls are strange. (laughs) I'm new at this. (laughs) Am I right? Yeah. And it was the same thing. Like, we were just really good, not even really good friends. Like, we were friends. Right. And that was it. And I think the... Or between our junior year, like we have a junior and a senior prom, mm-hmm. I was going to go with m- my crazy psycho girlfriend. And uh, this other friend of mine was like, you should dump that girl. Like she's she's kind of the worst. And at the time I had gained some confidence. I'm like, yeah, she is kind of the worst. And Tiffany sat in front of me in my, I think one of my calculus classes, one of my math classes. And I... Uh, I was helping her with something, and we, you know the TI-83 gigantic calculators that you had to oh, buy? Yeah. Do kids still have to buy those? Yep. Okay. But, you know, you can, like, you can put games on it, and you can, like, text message on those. That's what we used to use them as text, text me- message. Like, not to send it, but you would, like, write a text write message and then, like, hand it to them, and you could pass notes. And so Tiff and I just started, like, passing notes over a calculator. It's, like, the <laughs> nerdiest thing in the world. It is pretty nerdy. And I was like, oh, I broke up with what's her name? And she was like, that's good, because she was kind of the worst. And I'm like... I didn't really know that you, that. that you cared about my crazy girl. But she was like, yeah, you could do way better than that. I'm like, wow, that was really nice of you to say. And I'm like, be confident. I'm like, how about let's let's go. <laughs> you want to get married? Let's go to the prom together. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that could be cool. Maybe yeah. if, you know, if you're not busy, if you want to, like, you don't have to or nothing. But like, you know, let's, let's go to prom. She was like, no, I already got a date. And I'm going with what's his name over there. Who's all silly and has inverted fingernails. What? Yeah. His name was Billy. He was a cool guy. He has inverted fingernails. <laughs> inverted finger? What does he's that got, even mean? He's got scoopies. He's <laughs> not roundies, but scoopies. Creepiest thing? Nice guy. Weird. Got inverted fingernails. I've never even heard of that. Well, now you have. Scoopies. He's got scoopies and not roundies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm like, really? I'm like, you're going cool with, with Billy? Like, scoopies. Billy's not a bad guy, but like, I have a little bit of confidence right now. Like, mm. you should go with me instead. And she's like, nah, nah, that's cool. I'm already, I'm already taken. I'm like, dang it. So this is never going to happen. So time went by. I started working at the snow cone shop, which we talked about. And all, a bunch of my friends and everybody came up and, and hung out all the time. JJ had, they had broken up a while ago. And he and I worked at the snow cone shop together. And they started this thing where the, his mom owned the shop, where people could like order a snow cone party. Yeah. And you, like, get a giant cooler full of stuff. You take a bunch of bottles, and you show up at people's party, and you become, like, a snow cone bartender kind of weird thing. (laughs) Well, the YMCA had ordered one, so I went to go deliver it. And my friend Kelly, who I had known since, like, the fourth grade, who I was also kind of hitting on at the time, Hmm. and Tiffany worked there together. And I was hanging out with Kelly, trying to run run my high school game. I'm like, yeah, you know, what's up? I'm I'm cool, but I'm I'm trying to be cool. Because psycho ex-girlfriend taught me how I should not operate as a human being. Hmm. So now I'm going to be cool. Because that's what you should do. Just be be chill about it. And I was like, hey, Kelly, maybe we should go out sometime. And she's like, yeah, maybe I can ask my boyfriend. And I'm like, (laughs) dating. (laughs) I'm like, this sucks. Dating is dumb. Yeah, I agree. And then Kelly had to, she like left work. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm kind of done here. Because the girl who I, I knew... And I thought I could maybe have a relationship with, and not Tiffany, because Tiffany is this untouchable, cool figment that has existed. And she's like, what, you're not going to stay and hang out with me? I'm like, oh, God. Okay, <laughs> sure. Like, I can stay and hang out. And I was at the YMCA, so and the leader of the Y was like the coolest lady. And I just got to play with all these kids. Like, we could play dodgeball, and we go, like, run around outside. we play in the gym, and it was just super fun. 
And it, she got to see me just like playing and laughing around with these kids. Hmm. And I don't know if there's some weird maternal thing kicked in, but she liked me and it was super strange. And I'm like, you got to be cool about this. <laughs> this is what, like seventh grade through the almost 12th grade. So like a good four or five year kind of. Yeah. Not even a relationship, like at, at a distance. And I wanted to ask her out and I'm like, I'm not real keen on other people's emotions, but I think she wants me to ask her out, but I'm a huge dork. So I wrote on a little note like you do in like elementary school. Nice. And I gave it to her. She circled yes. And I'm like, huzzah. I guess we're boyfriend, girlfriend. And the first time we kissed was in the parking lot at the YMCA and all of the kids were watching <laughs> and they were <laughs> cheering us on Nice, <laughs> because they like the YMCA leader was like, anytime you want to come back and hang out with these kids, like you totally can. Cause I was a fun person. And so I would go back just cause I wanted to hang out with Tiffany and I enjoyed hanging out with all these kids. Cause it was just a fun place to be. And all the kids cheered and it was great. Uh, and that was our senior year. So started our senior year. And then we went off to college. She went to Jacksonville and I went to Orlando. And we would drive like the two hours back and forth. And sometimes I would just like fall asleep on the floor of her apartment. Or not her apartment, her dorm. And her roommate got really angry at me. <laughs> and then I left school and I joined the army and she was still in college. And I had proposed... When I was in the army. So you go to basic training and then you go to like a school to teach you your job. And so I was in my job school mm -hmm. in um, Williamsburg, Virginia. And some amazing friends of ours. He was also in training with me. But his wife moved into like an apartment like right off base. So like they were already married and awesome people. And we hung out all the time. And, but she came up one weekend when I had like a pass. And we went to Bush Gardens in Williamsburg. Hmm. And I was like, yo, I'm going to propose. I went to Zales. I got a ring. Zales? Didn't go to Jared? I didn't. I don't think Jared was around. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the same thing. Like, Tiff never cared what people thought about her. She didn't care about drama. She didn't. She was the opposite of that psycho girlfriend. Hmm. She was real. She was funny. She had flaws. And she was unapologetic about it. And she was independent. I think the thing I loved the most was that she didn't need me. Right. That other girl was a, she was a succubus. Like she was a, just a life sucking troll that I had to take her everywhere. I had to do everything for her. Like we'd be eating lunch at school and she's like, I don't want to eat this. Josh, take me to this place, this restaurant. I'm like, well, when you got food in front of you, like I, I make money at a job. I'm like, why don't you make money at a job? And I remember one day she was just, just nagging like a naggy wife. And for some reason I had brought like a bowl of cornflakes. Don't know why. But she was sitting across from me just like, wah, 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 and she called me stupid for some reason. Mm. And don't ever call me stupid because that's the thing that I pride myself on not being. And so I took three quarters of that bowl of cornflakes and it all just congealed into a big pasty flake mush and just flipped it right in her face. Whoa. And just cut splat. And everybody in the lunchroom saw it. And she stood up like dripping milk and cornflake mush off her face. And she just like stomped out and left. And uh, a couple people clapped. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember looking over at my friend. I'm like, well, that's not going to go well. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, that was pretty great. And uh, it was that was the sharp downhill to that relationship. Mm, yeah. But Tiff laughed whenever I told her. She's like, yeah, that girl deserved a good batch of cereal to the face. <laughs> a little cereal but like, face. Tiff didn't need me at all. Yeah. She had her own job. She had her own car. Like, she had her family stuff and her backstory, but it made her who she was. And I just thought that that was so appealing. It's not as a, as a boyfriend or girlfriend, but like you talked about, if, if the end goal for dating is marriage, which mine, I think, was because I had such a good example of loving parents, like a husband and wife, that I'm like, it would be odd. I know she's good with kids. I'm, I'm watching her be good with kids. Mm -hmm. She likes me for some stupid reason, and I'm not trying to get her to like me. She just paid enough attention to realize that I was a decent human being. And she was so independent that that was extremely attractive. And 
the Bush Gardens thing. So I had talked to the, the friends of mine. I'm like, I want to get a caricature drawn because it's cheesy and we normally wouldn't do it. I'm like, but I want the caricature to be the will you marry me thing. So I sat uh. down, the guy starts drawing me and then he stops at like my head and he's like, okay, lady, you sit down now and I'm going to finish drawing you. So I got the ring from Zales in my pocket. My friend is recording over there on the phone and then he's drawing the will you marry me thing and people are starting to gather in like a big crowd. And she's just like, why is everybody looking at me? She's like, this is, she's like, is he drawing something silly? I'm like, yeah, it's kind of silly. And I'm like freaking out, super nervous. You know, some people in the back are like, oh my God, it says what you meant. And I'm turning around like, shut your mouth. Why would they do that? Shut your mouth. And he like ripped the thing off and turned it around. And she just like starts crying, makes that little face. Nice. And I, I get down on one knee, which I swore I would never do because I thought it was super cliche. And I don't even remember what I said, but she stopped me halfway through and like kissed me. And I'm like, I, I didn't actually get to propose You gotta yet. let me say like, it. Like, <laughs> I had a whole thing. And she said yes. And we were engaged. And then I finished up job school and went to, like, first duty station in Louisiana. And my plan was for her to finish college and not move in with me, her husband, in our house that I was given because you're in the military. I was like, I'm not, I don't want you to ever accuse me of ruining your life by making you quit school. I'm like, stay in school. You're kind of banned from coming in my house. <laughs> love you. Yeah. I love you, so stay way over there, and yeah. I will send you money and health care. You're welcome. And she was not keen on that idea. So she and my brother, like, packed up a moving van with a whole bunch of hand-me-down stuff from people that we knew and showed up in the to the middle of nowhere in Louisiana. And... Oh, yeah, we got married. I'm sorry. There was a time in there where we got married. We got married in a, a super small ceremony with like six people. And then we did the bigger one later on. I don't know how common that. I think it's common for people in the military to do it that way. But the second wedding sucked. The first wedding was awesome. Hmm. And so, yeah, then we got that was f- f- almost this year will be 16 years ago. Nice. Yeah, we got married, Joe. There's a kid stomping above me for no particular reason, but it is a very intentional stomp. Mm-hmm. Is that a basketball? Maybe. Maybe basketball. They know better, but it's possible. Well, that's cool. Isn't it funny that like we both kind of had the same, were drawn to someone who didn't care and didn't need us? Because that's a really good way to put it. Uh, Jenny yeah. didn't need me either. She nope. was she doing her thing. She wanted me. She didn't need me. Mm-hmm. And I was able to make that distinction. And... I remember when I told her that, she kind of made the like, hmm, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, cool. Because if I am somebody's like, if I had married What's-Her-Face, oh my God, that would have been absolutely terrible. Yeah. And I knew that. And we had that conversation. And I remember talking about kids. And like when you're in high school and your parents try to have the like birds and bees talk. And I'm like, I know I've been going out with this girl for like a year, but trust me, you guys, you don't have to worry about sex. Because if something accidentally happened, I do not want half of my kid to be her. And they're like, well, all right then. Uh, good talk. So just keep dating terrible people yeah. and then it won't ever and be a problem, I guess. It was a, it was a self-confidence thing. I don't know. But yeah, one day it just kind of, there's a cereal in the face. She worked at Pizza Hut and I had to pick up from Pizza Hut and she like made the dough. And there's this can of aerosol stuff that she had to spray on the dough. And she smelled so bad. So bad. <laughs> and I would have to pick her up every day in my 1986 Chrysler Laser Turbo. And I'm like, you're stinking up my car with your filth. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Jenny, when we were dating, she used to work at Lady and Sons, the What's famous that? like Oh, restaurant. Uh, is that like Paula Dean's Paula place. Dean's place. But she w- started working there before they moved into the big restaurant. It was just a small little local place. Oh. and. She knew Paula Dean before she was racist. Yeah. She's so. not racist. <laughs> She's a nice lady. Anyway. Um, and she used to come home from every shift. I would go pick her up. Same kind of thing. And she smelled like... It sounds good. She smelled like butter and biscuits. Sounds mm. like it would be nice. Not. Uh, it's not, not the good mm. butter and biscuits. It's like... The, 
in the kitchen butter and biscuits, not the eating butter and biscuits. Wow. And it was just like, ugh. or fried chicken. She kind of had that thing going on. But yeah, it was always oil. kind of a running joke because she just like stunk so bad from serving other people food. Mm. You know, Tiff got a job at AutoZone, which I think is still kind of funny. Hmm. But yeah, she smelled like oil and battery acid, <laughs> <laughs> which was far more appealing than the Pizza Hut dough. I bet. That's pretty funny. I always thought it was really silly that she... I don't know why she stopped working at the Y, but she, her dad helped her buy a new car, and so she had to make the payments, but he had co-signed on the loan. So she was like, I have to get a job. Hmm. And I was almost hiring. I'm like, why in the world are you, like a 100-pound, 5'3 girl who knows nothing about cars working at AutoZone? She's like, I don't really have to do anything. She's like, people aren't asking mm-hmm. me to replace a transmission. I'm like, ah, oh, touche. Yeah. Good point. Um, any other stories there? I don't know how long we've been going, but I don't know. In case nobody uh, cares about this, we don't really. <laughs> I, I know my wife and I don't care about Valentine's Day, and I take it that you and your wife don't really either. Nope. But for those people that do, like, good for you. Um, I it's may this is extremely cliche, and I understand that. But like, I try every day to show my wife how much I appreciate her because I think back to that psycho hose beast that I was dating. And what could have been, and I am, I feel extremely fortunate that my wife lowered her standards enough to start dating me. <laughs> and so every day that I could convey that she made the right choice uh, is a win for me. I just want to reinforce that. Yeah. Yep. Because there's handsome people all over the world, and I can't shield her from all of them. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Oh, wait, there's two more of these pieces. Cool. Well, um, I guess we can wrap it up unless you got anything else. I don't know. I'm good. Uh, Where can people find you? Uh, Everywhere at Josh underscore makes stuff. Oh, and at WorkbenchCon next week. Oh, yeah. Totally forgot about that. All four of us are going to WorkbenchCon. So if you're listening to this, it will be a few days away. So if you don't have tickets... You're just probably, come anyway. You just walk in. I don't think they're checking IDs or anything. I think they probably will. Well, I mean, whatever. Just walk in. Act like you're very confident. That's the thing. Just walk in and say, I'm a speaker. Yeah. And they probably won't question it. Go like, oh, uh, like Steve has my badge. Get yourself a clipboard and just charge on in the door. You're fine. Put on a fake mustache. <laughs> walk in. My name is Steve Bramsey. <laughs> maybe you've <laughs> maybe heard of me. Don't worry. My name's... James DeBlesta. <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, um, yeah, if you're coming to WorkbenchCon, please come by and talk to us and say hello. Please. Uh, no, it'd be cool to meet you if we haven't met you. And if we have met you, then it'll be good to see you again. Yeah. And if you, we are giving, the two of us are giving a class on Friday at 4 p.m. About... Oh, we need to actually figure that out. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at winging it. Um. But we're giving a class on the benefits of Fusion 360, like a Fusion 360 kind of beginner's guide. So if you're interested in a class, bring your computer, um, bring questions that you may have, and we will do our best to help you along in the time allotted. Yes. We won't have a lot of time, but I think it's going to be kind of a crash course primer kind of deal, not a super in-depth thing, but just to get people understanding why it's useful, I think. Um, Also, big thanks to the Banker Alliance. They're awesome. And if you want to join the Maker Alliance, go to I like to make stuff.com slash join. Or yeah, do that. that that's, works, there's a there's a different URL yeah. on screen. But yeah, go to slash join uh, and you can check it out. Get behind the scenes videos, extra videos, videos early. Including the new between the builds that yes. is right over there on that machine that Anthony put together. Did a bang up job. Yes. Good Episode job, two is done and in the can. Doesn't waiting. have a thumbnail yet because Anthony hasn't picked a picture yet. <laughs> I don't work on it. <laughs> anyway, that's it for this one. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.